Well, good morning, church family. Can we try that again? That was a little weak. Good morning, church family. There we go. That sounds like some children of God that are excited to be in his house this morning, right? Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tyler Peacock. I have the pleasure of being a pastor in residency here at Edgewater Alliance Church. And what that means is that my wife, Mary, and I have been serving here for about two years now, and we're getting ready to go launch a new congregation just south of here called Relationship Alliance Church. Now, that, that's probably, thank you, amen, amen. Now, that's probably not new news to most of you in the room, but I do come bearing news this morning. I wanted to give you a brief update before we jump into our word. Uh, so last time I was here, we were celebrating a beautiful worship and prayer night where we had locked down a space and we had started renovations and we called a bunch of people together uh, to pray over that space and just dedicate it to the Lord, and it was amazing. Since that time... Uh, through the help of a few ha faithful hands here in this room, that space has been completed. So the space is done. This was just after we finished painting the floors, but right before we got all the furniture in, we were able to build the coffee bar where Lord willing, Monday through Friday, we'll minister to people in a missional way and serve them coffee and just invite people in and create a safe space for the community to receive Jesus. And we also were able to change all the lighting so that on Sundays and Wednesdays, that space can be converted to a space that's fruitful for worship and prepared to receive what the Lord has for us as that congregation congregation develops. Now, just like we called together the people of God to worship over the space and anoint it and pray over it, I felt led that we should call together the people of God to celebrate the completion. And by God's grace, we had 152 people show up to celebrate the completion of that space. Amen. Amen. And you know, the, the most the biggest blessing to me is there were some of you that are in this room also in that room, but there were people in that room who hadn't been in a traditional church in over a decade, some 15 years, 20 years, people who aren't willing to step foot into a space like this, no matter what we do, are coming to a place like this to receive prayer. We've already received a testimony of a young lady who was struggling with depression and anxiety who stepped foot in this room and somebody here in this very room laid hands on her and prayed over her and by God's grace, she has been set free of those things and now has come to join the core team of this new church plant. And so we're already seeing God answer and be faithful to the promises he had when he called us to plant this new expression down the way. Now, the secondary mission of this expression is, is and something that's on my heart and that's on Pastor Connor's heart, and you heard a little bit about it with that ministry that we just shared with you, is to see the church collaborate beyond the walls of our various denominations and things that have separated us for so many years. So part of that was, this was a Wednesday night. We're praying over the people in the community. People are coming and being set free. And next thing you know, Thursday morning, we had 32 pastors sitting in that same very space, coming together in prayer and in love, asking the question, how we can unite? And this isn't just pastors. These are business leaders. These are ministry leaders, people from all over this region, this New Smyrna, Edgewater, Oak Hill. Actually, I should say from Port Orange to Titusville, really, because we had a couple people that were just coming to see how God is moving in this region. And that is is absolutely beautiful. That is why we have partnered together for the last two years to start this new expression. And that is what I want you guys to continue to pray towards. We've started our core team meetings every Wednesday night at six o'clock. We're gathering together for worship, communion, prayer, talk about what it means, what it's gonna look like, how we're gonna tangibly impact this community in the name of Jesus. So if you're in the room and you maybe feel the Holy Spirit moving upon you, please feel free to come and join us and learn a little bit more on Wednesday night about what this whole thing's all about. With that being said, I wanna pray for our time together and then we're gonna jump into our word. Father, I thank you for all the ways you're moving in this region. Lord, I thank you for all the ways you're moving in this room right now. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice, every child of yours, whether they know they are or not yet. Lord, I thank you for the ways that we are set free by your work on the cross, not by a single thing we've ever done. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to fill this place as you already have. 
Lord, would you anoint my words as they go forward? Let them be received as yours and not mine because my words are useless and Lord, yours are the way, the truth, and the life. Father, this time is yours, I am yours, these people are yours, and we give you all the glory, unworthy but receiving your abounding grace as your sons, daughters, and servants. The church said, amen, amen. So over the past few months on this journey to plant a church, I have also been taking a journey to uh, prepare for ordination with our denomination called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Now this isn't a uh, small task. It typically takes about two years and we've set out to do it in 12 months. And by God's grace, next month I will be ordained with the Christian Missionary Alliance and that is a blessing and I'm thankful. Amen. And it is, I, I can take no credit other than the Holy Spirit and this church family loving me, supporting me, teaching me, equipping me. It has been a wonderful journey, seriously. I, I cherish every one of you. I hope you know that. Um, but in that time, the Lord has been working inside of me in a unique way. And what I mean by that is he has been sharing his heart with me in a way that I had yet to experience before this journey began. You see, I've shared in the Lord's heart, I think like we all have, when someone gets baptized and we share in the Lord's heart and we feel that joy and we're overcome and we can't help but smile and sometimes even cry. There's a running joke in my house that if you wanna see my wife cry, baptize someone. And she just, she breaks down. It, but it's, it's beautiful, right? But the other day, about two weeks ago, I was in a meeting with Pastor Connor as we usually are during the beginning of the week. And I almost felt like I was so heavy that I had to dismiss myself. And, and I left and I jumped in my car and for two hours, I drove around Florida shores weeping. I just drove around crying because as I was driving, it was as though the Lord was letting me bear his burden for this city and this region for just a, a mere moment. And I'm thankful that it was just for a mere moment because I could not bear that for good. You see, as I drove around, I saw addictions in all forms. As I drove around, I saw the spirit of rejection around this city. And then as I drove around, I continued to see this spirit of post-religion, where people had not rejected Jesus, but they had rejected the church. They had rejected people. They weren't mad at God, they were mad at the Christians who had hurt them. And, and as I, I would just drive and stop and talk and pray with different people, and that went on for about two hours, but this is something that, the, that God has just been moving in me. And later that evening, because God has a sense of humor, I'm down at RAC and we're completing the space, getting ready for the worship night, and we're, we're sweeping the floors and we're cleaning, we're getting ready to lock the door, and a man comes walking in He's probably in his mid 40s, and uh, he he is looking for to go food. He thinks that we're a restaurant and that we're open. So I explain to him we're a coffee house, we're not open yet, so on and so forth. He offers me money to try and use the bathroom. Naturally, I let him use the restroom free of charge. But he, after he came out, I felt led by the Spirit to to just say, "Hey, are are you okay?" Because it was clear he was going through something. And he goes, you know, I'm just so sick and tired of putting on the mask. And in that moment, I didn't feel led to share a specific scripture verse with him. And hear my heart in this message this morning, I believe in the power of the word of God and the teaching of the word of God. But in this particular moment, I did not feel led to share with him John 3.16 or Romans 5. What I felt led to do was to give him a hug and share with him the heart of Christ. And I gave him a hug and in his embrace, I could feel the craving, the, the, the need for that embrace. And I just gave him a hug and I said, hey man, not for nothing, I don't know if it's your thing, but God loves you. And because God loves you, I love you. And if you ever need a place that you don't have to wear a mask, you can call this place home and you are always welcome here. And I just simply said a nice little prayer. I just let him go, nothing too crazy. And within a few minutes, his mom comes pulling up to pick him up. And this man, like a small child, was so filled with joy that he yells to his mom in the car, mom, for the first time in 20 years, I felt the presence of God. 
And I don't know what it is, but I gotta come back here. And so we're praying that we will see that man and we will see him come to Christ. And as he's actively walking in addiction, which has ruined his life, he shared his story with me and he was just like some of us. He was successful, he owned his own business. And they hurt his back and they prescribed him some medication that took hold of his life and ruined every bit of it, which is all too common of a story that none of us are too far from. And so that is what we are going to look at this morning because as I wrestle through this, I remembered a conversation that I had not long ago about playgrounds. And now you may be thinking to yourself, what does a playground have to do with God? Ironically, we were having that conversation as we were talking about the decision to put a fence around the new playground here at EAC or not. And what we found was a team of architects who had conducted a study. And they conducted this study on preschool children and playgrounds with and without fences. And what the psychological factors would be on those two, two variations. And what they found is interesting because on playgrounds without fences the children would barely play. You see, they would huddle around the teacher and they wouldn't stray very far. They would barely even use the equipment. But then the moment the architects added a playground, the children would explore every square inch. They would run, they would play, they would feel the safety and freedom of their proper boundaries. And for those of us in the, in the room this morning who have children or who have raised children, we understand the importance of boundaries, amen? You see, because children with too few of boundaries, they often become reckless. They often become careless and they're, they're a danger or they go the other way and they don't understand the world and they become anxious and fearful. But then if we, if we keep them in the small circle and we never let them get exposed to things that scare them and we give them too many boundaries, well, then they either become fearful of anything that doesn't look like, smell like, or talk like them or they become rebellious and they reject our rules and our principles the moment they're able to. But if we find the proper balance between those two, and by no stretch of the imagination of, as a father, am I claiming to have done that? I am still actively pursuing that, so if anybody's got any tips, please send them to my email. But if we find the proper balance of boundaries, what we see, much like what we saw in this study, is freedom, we see curiosity, we see exploration, and we see wonder. We see kids being kids. And today, we're going to focus on that last one. We're going to explore what it means to get back to our freedom, our curiosity, and our wonder in our walk with Jesus. Because there's a biblical theme that runs from the beginning to the end of Scripture of being childlike. And that's what we're going to explore today. And it starts in Psalm 116, verse 6. It says, the Lord protects those of childlike faith. I was facing death and he saved me. But it's not simply an Old Testament thing. It goes all the way into the epistles under 1 Peter 2.2, which says, like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. But if you have your Bibles with you today, we're gonna kind of land and, and preach out of a scripture, an interaction between the disciples and Jesus in Matthew 18. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew 18, starting in verse one. I'm reading out of the NLT, which reads like this. About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and he put the child among them and then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of God. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who, who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. 
But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Pretty bold statements by our Savior. And as you read that, it becomes clear that this concept of childlike is something that Jesus is passionate about. Mark's account of this same interaction illustrates that even more so when he says, when Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me, don't stop them. For the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. So what is Jesus talking about when he says the kingdom of God? And what is he talking about when he says to be childlike? Those are the two things we're gonna explore together this morning, but the Moody Bible Commentary says this about the kingdom of God in this passage. It says the kingdom of God refers to God's rule over one's life. Unless one receives God's rule with a childlike faith and dependence upon God, he will never enter his kingdom. Now, it sounds simple to be childlike. It's one of those things in our faith that's very easy to say, but if we're being quite candid with one another, I, I personally believe it is one of the hardest things to walk out. You see, if I came in here this morning and I built a scriptural foundation for you to pray for you to serve in the church, for you to give, which all of those things are absolutely wonderful scriptural commands. You'd be like, hey, I'm in, let's do it, that's tangible. I can feel it, I can do it, I can see it. But when we come to the altar and we say, Lord, I'm humbling myself before you, exposing all my dirty laundry, and I'm gonna be strictly dependent upon you, not on my wisdom, not on my ways, not on my money, not on my family, not on my spouse, but strictly dependent upon you, Lord. Well, all of a sudden, we start to fall back on our heels a little bit and say, hey, <laughs> I thought you said pray, serve, give. But how do we get there? See, I don't think we start there. How many of you in the room remember the joy of your salvation? How many of you in the room remember when God called you, whether you were a young child or a grown adult, whether you were on your deathbed and miraculously healed or you heard the word of God preached in a way that reached down into your inner man and changed you forever? The joy of your salvation does not start with a lack of wonder. It actually starts quite the contrary. It starts in full wonder, in, stu in full splendor, in awe of God. So how do we lose that? And is it possible as followers of Jesus to make our way back if we've gotten away from it? The answer is gonna fall on jeopardy under things I never thought I'd hear the preacher say for 500. <laughs> we know too much about our faith. Or at least we think we do. And I want you to bear with me because I know that that just hits some of you square in the chest, right? My theologians, my professors, my teachers. And I'm not rebuking the, the dissection of scripture and the learning and the wisdom and growing in stature and wisdom in Christ and being able to defend your faith at the ready. Those are all things that I love and I do personally but not at the sacrifice of our wonder. You see, one thing I've learned with my children is that as they age, they go through phases, right? There's even an app that'll tell you what phase you can expect next for your child, right? It's kind of, it's, I think it's the same app that tells you your kid's the size of a peach, you know, and yeah. Anyways, but they start off real cute, right? They can't talk, they can't walk, they're just eating and doing all the stuff. And then they start walking and all of a sudden the water line in the house comes up four feet and there's nothing valuable below four feet in the house. 
And then they make it to this phase that we all know and love. It's the why phase. Why? But why? You see, my daughter's transitioning out of that phase right now. And, and honestly, it was one of my favorites because she, we would go somewhere and I would have to learn because I had to answer her. So we would go to the zoo and she'd be like, dad, why do they do that? And I'd be like, Google. Uh, yeah. And then I'm just this astute, smart guy that now she respects, maybe. But now she's transitioning and she's transitioning to the I know phase. Oh yeah, y'all know that one, right? I can't tell her anything. She, she's never seen this thing before, but she has mastered it. Honey, you're gonna hurt yourself if you do that. I know. Honey, you're not supposed to use it that way. I know. But you're still using it that way. Yeah, I know. Okay. But they grow in phases and it's, it's beautiful and it's wonderful to watch, but I wonder how we all sit here and laugh. Does God look down upon us in our faith and, and laugh sometimes when we reach this I know phase? You see, because I think we start out craving the spiritual milk. We start out in the why phase. We're walking around like, God, why did you make it that way? Why did you do that? God, why did this guy come walking in as I'm sweeping floors looking for food when nothing says we're open and nothing says we're a restaurant? And then we end up in this I know phase. And we think that we fully understand our faith. You see, we think that we, we fully understand what God wants and we're just in this, in this area of faith based on our competency. And as our competency grows, our curiosity dwindles. We're no longer asking why, but rather we're, say, we're walking up to everyone with our nose up saying, I know why. You may not know, but I know. And I know better than you know, so you gotta listen to me. When all along, I think we're supposed to be asking why. And, and when, that, when that curiosity dwindles, our creativity begins to be shoved down. Because when we stop asking why, we stop asking how, and we just accept what is. We no longer look at things and say, how can we reach those people differently? We no longer look at things and say, how can I go deeper in this area? We just say, okay, this is where I, where I am taken. This is what my Bible study says. This is where I'm going. And that's good. It's good enough for me. But in that, in that space, the wonder of following Jesus is lost. And if you're in the room this morning and you're like, my wonder is lost. My faith no longer feels like a living spring within me bubbling up and being shared with those around me, but rather it feels like this dry, pretentious, rigid thing that I do. This is not a condemnation on you. Rather, much like the joy of your salvation, this morning is an outstretched hand of the living God saying, return unto me. Return to a childlike faith and I will show you the way. You see, because one thing I recognize in Matthew 18 is that the same disciples that are arguing over who's the greatest in the kingdom of God, they're arguing over seniority and superiority. We've never seen that in the kingdom, right? Those are the same disciples who just a few chapters prior in scripture were in absolute shock and awe that Jesus would call them as simple fishermen to join him on mission. And then a few chapters later, they're sitting here having some kind of debate about whose theology is better. Rather than worrying about the very thing that God called them to. But why is that? You see, I firmly believe that whether you are six or 60 or you have been following Jesus for a month or 70 years, your faith should be filled with awestruck wonder. Every single day, you should wake up and want to go explore God's creation. You should wake up and view it more like a playground than a school. 
Tomorrow morning, those of you with kids, I want you to try and wake your kids up and say, hey, buddy, instead of uh, going to school today on Monday, I'm gonna take you to the playground. We're gonna play hooky and I'm gonna take you to the playground. And then the next day, I want you to wake them up and say, hey, you ready? Get up for school. Tell me which one wakes up with more awestruck wonder. That's the difference between viewing our faith and a life with Jesus as a playground with proper boundaries and as some astute school where this is all we do and this is how we do it because the church says so. And I pastor a church, so I promise you, I love the church. You see, I used to be like this. I used to read scripture in this way. And one thing that stuck out to me profoundly was one time I was reading 1 John 5, 4, and it reads like this. It says, for every child of God, there's that child thing again, child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. Beautiful words, encouraging words. But in my mind, I would read that, and if I was still actively struggling, if I was walking through something that, didn't com- that I didn't comprehend, the blame went inward. I would read this and go, okay, I, I, I'm struggling because I don't have enough faith. I've yet to be healed or delivered because I don't have enough faith. Or I'm still struggling with anxiety because I just don't understand the word of God well enough yet. But then you go one verse later in 1 John 5, 5, and it says, and who can win this battle against the world? Well, surely the theologians. Surely scripture is getting ready to tell us those with the largest quantity of faith can win this battle. No, no. 1 John 5, 5 says, only those who believe that Jesus is the son of God. There's absolutely zero mention of wisdom. There is zero mention of quantity. And what I realized in this moment is that it is not the amount of faith we have, but it is the type of faith we have. Do you have a astute faith built on your understanding or do you have a childlike faith built on a dependence of the living God? This call to be childlike is so much more about posture than it is practice. This is not a rebuke this morning to say, don't go and practice your faith. This is not to say, stop praying and serving and giving. This is not to make our faith some sort of mystical thing, but it's rather to recognize that it's both and. We cannot sacrifice the wonder of our faith as our competency increases. It's important to note right now, though, that my call to you this morning is to become childlike, not childish. And as funny as that might sound, there is practice of what I'm preaching this morning that is remarkably childish. And I think we all know the the things and places that I'm talking about. But far too often, I think that we can get to a place of thinking that we have God figured out. And what happens is God has laid the playground walls within scripture for us. And he said, this is your free place to explore. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like, but bear with me if you will. There's there's this place that we're free to explore. And then what happens is someone right over there in the corner is doing something that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. It It might be right along the fence line. I'll agree with that but it's a little bit uncomfortable. We don't fully understand it. And what we do is we place a smaller fence within the fence. We say, I'm no longer going to this area of the fence line, even though God gave it to me and I recognize that. I'm no longer going to that area because it's a little uncomfortable and it's weird and I don't like it and so I'm gonna stay over here. And can I tell you this morning, bad practice 
over there is no excuse for no practice over here. Because eventually when you make your fence so small, you have nowhere to explore. There's, there's nowhere else to go and so you end up in a no practice situation. You end up not exploring at all. You end up with this faith that is dry and rigid, much like what we were just talking about. But what is the fence line? How do we know the boundaries? And the good news is that it's been given to us very clearly. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong. There's the fence line what is true and what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. All scripture is the fence line, all of it. Psalm 32, eight says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. I want you to hear this this morning. When you are operating within the boundaries of scripture, You have freedom to explore. You have freedom to be curious. I promise you, God is not scared of your questions and your wondering. There is no expectation on you or me to have it all figured out here this morning. The call, rather, is much like my child in the Y phase that I live there that I live in the why phase and never take myself to the I know phase. You see, and if we get back to this place of saying, I'm going to explore, if we seek to move ourselves back to childlike, eventually what you will find, it doesn't happen overnight, but what, what you will find is you'll wake up in the morning and you'll feel that wonder again. You'll feel what it feels like to wake up in the morning and wonder what God has for you today. What is he gonna do in the line at Winn-Dixie today? God, what conversation are you gonna have today? Those, Those voices of doubt will flee from your mind and you will be renewed by the transforming of your mind as the scriptures say. You'll no longer walk in a way that when I say God healed someone in the aisle six of Winn-Dixie, you're like, eh, where's the photos? Let me see that. Because you'll begin to understand the playground. You'll begin to understand the fence line and you'll stop shrinking it. But in order to give you something tangible to, to, to grasp onto, we find ourselves within the proper boundaries becoming more humble. Because the boundaries in Matthew 5, 5 say, God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. Having childlike faith within the boundaries of scripture will allow you to be real. Because you'll remember Romans 3, 23, which says, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So you'll no longer feel the need to wear a mask amidst the family of God. You can take that off and throw it away knowing that we've all fallen short. Living within the boundaries of scripture, we will feel free. Remembering Galatians 2.16 that says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. You see, God's playground says that you will never be made right. No no matter how good you are or how bad you are, Jesus loves you the same on your worst day and on your best day. And when you're in the playground of scripture, when you're in that fence line, man, that's freedom. And within that fence line, it's loving. Because we remember Romans 5, 6 through 8, that says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. 
Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, and though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And that same Christ who died for us has called us to love as I first loved you. So within the fence line of scripture, we love one another. But how then do we return our hearts to this tender place? If you're in the room this morning and you're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit to return your heart to a childlike place, how do you do it? G.K. Chesterton was on to something when he said this, because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit, fierce and free, Therefore, they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we are. What a profound thought. You see, next time, if you wanna see that quote in reality, next time you're walking with a child anywhere at all, realize that when they're walking, they see someone waving and smiling and they wave and they smile back. But you see the homeless man who's getting ready to ask you for another dollar. Realize that the child sees a bushel of flowers that they're gonna pick and they're gonna bring them to mommy and she's gonna be happy and there's gonna be this love and this joy and it's an exciting moment and it's wonderful. But you see the dandelion weed that you killed last week and it grew back. Realize that when a child hears music, they experience freedom beyond belief, a freedom to move their body And listen to the music, an excitement that surpasses their understanding. But you, in all your wisdom, you remember that time you did that move at the wedding and embarrassed yourself, so you just would rather sit down and stay still. You see, in this season, by God's grace, I'm seeing my children more than I ever have. And I'm so thankful for that. To the point that it would bring me to tears. But in that, In that season, the more time I spend around my littles, I begin to ask the question, God, did did you send them for me to teach or for them to teach me? Because as I'm walking last night on the beach as we normally do, I'm sitting here, don't go there, don't do that, don't do this, That, that puddle's wet, and my son just sees this amazing water park that is a tide pool on New Smyrna Beach full of algae and all this other stuff that my competency has removed my wonder. And now this morning, I'm not going to stand up here and claim to have the 10 ways to get back to childlike. I'm not gonna give you the four perfect steps to realign your spirit to be childlike But I can tell you that in Mark 10, Jesus tells us to receive a gift, or receive as a child receives a gift. And I don't know when the last time you handed a child a wrapped gift, but man, they're curious, (laughs) they're excited, and they are completely dependent upon the moment when the top of that box breaks it and they can see what's inside. So in all humility this morning before you, I'm going to say that with the help of the Holy Spirit and God's word, I am actively seeking once again to become curious, to remain completely dependent upon that moment that God shows me what he has in store for me. 
And I am actively seeking to once again have wonder in my walk with Jesus. And my invite to you all this morning is that you, through prayer, would seek the same thing. Would you all stand as I read this prayer of Jesus? In Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus prayed this prayer. He said, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. So Father, my prayer for myself and everyone under the sound of my voice this morning is that we would not find ourselves wise and clever, that we would no longer have the things of your kingdom hidden from us, Lord, that we would find ourselves as humble as children. Lord, and in that, I know your faithful spirit will renew in us a wonder and a curiosity. So Father, I come against for my brothers and sisters just this spirit of rigidity, the spirit of religious practice. Lord, I stand against that for them and I just, I just pray, Lord, for myself and my brothers and sisters that you would move in a profound way within our hearts to break down those walls. Father, we are yours, wholly, completely. Restore in us the joy of our salvation and let us walk that out every single day Within the confines, the fence line of your word, Father, let us explore your playground with glory, wonder, and awe. It's in Jesus' name, unworthy but receiving your abounding grace, that your children said, amen. amen. I love you, church family. Go in peace.